Hi. Thank you very much. Oh, and thank you. Thank you very much, too. Right. Hi. Welcome to the UEA Christmas Lecture for Children. You are the children, and I am the lecturer, which means that I'm a teacher, but in a university. And today, we are going to talk about Christmas. Everyone who celebrates Christmas at this time of year has their own way of doing it. But there are some things that most people agree are important, things that are traditional, that make Christmas Christmas. So, class, you need to be ready to put your hands up. I want to see your hands going up, okay? I'm going to say uh, a few things about Christmas, and I want you to put your hands up if you agree with me. First one. Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without Christmas presents. Yeah, okay, all right, okay. I think pretty much everybody agrees about that one. Okay, another one. Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without Christmas dinner. Yeah, okay, all right, Christmas dinner, pretty popular in the room. Ah, no, no, no. Keep your hands up if you like sprouts. Oh, okay, wow, wow. Sprouts are doing pretty well this year. Okay. Um, all right, last one. Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without Christmas poems. Okay, all right, well, these are my people. Thank you for putting your hands up. Um, the bad news is that you've just come along to a lecture about Christmas poems. Uh, the good news is I am here to change your minds. Uh, so my name is uh, Dr. Jeremy Noel Todd, uh, and I am a doctor of literature. Uh, and that means that people bring their books to me when they're poorly, like this one. I've got this very poorly book here with me. Uh, and I check them out. I see what's wrong with them. Uh, I listen to them. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah, breathe. Cough. Ooh. Oh, no, I'm not sure about this book. Um, okay, all right, I, I really am a doctor, but I'm not, uh, I'm not a medical doctor. Uh, I'm an academic doctor. I'm a doctor who works in a university. Uh, and my job in the School uh, of Literature uh, is to think about things like books and poems, why they were written, what they mean, uh, why we like them, all that sort of thing. Uh, and as well as teaching students in lecture theatres like this, it's also my job as an academic to do research. And that means finding out new things about poems, coming up with new ideas about them, and trying to persuade other people that these things are interesting. And this is what, in the university, we call demonstrating a hypothesis. Because if there's one thing that we love in the university, it's long words. Uh, so, what's a hypothesis? A hypothesis is an idea that you think might be true. But you have to research it, you have to look into it further. You have to show other people that there is evidence to support it. So today, I am gonna to try to demonstrate to you my hypothesis that Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without poetry. I'm gonna to try to change your mind by doing some research right here, right now. So, maybe we need to start with a definition. What is poetry? That's a big question, there it is. Um, but here is one answer from the Oxford English Dictionary. What is poetry? Poetry is a patterned arrangement of language in which the expression of feelings and ideas is given intensity. What does that mean, though? Um, I think what it's saying is that a poem is a piece of writing which makes a pattern in words to express thoughts and feelings with intensity. Um, so a poet is trying to say something strongly, something heartfelt in a way that makes a pattern. And because it makes a pattern, it is also memorable. And that is one of the shortest definitions of poetry that I know. There was a poet called W.H. Auden who called poetry memorable speech, memorable speech. So I'm gonna say it again, Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without 
Christmas poetry. And now I'm going to begin to test that hypothesis. I am going to say a line of poetry, and you are going to say the next one. And I am willing to bet that you will know it, that it will be something memorable that you will already have in your head. Okay, so we're going to start with an easy one. This, this is the line, and I want you to say what you think the next line is. We wish you a Merry Christmas. <laughs> Very good. Gold stars all around. Give yourselves a round of applause. <laughs> okay, but don't get complacent, because this is now going to get difficult. The next one uh, that I'm going to hit you with is this line of poetry, and you're going to tell me how it goes. Then I'm going to give you another one, and then you're going to tell me how it goes. So, here is my next example. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And if you ever saw it, you would say it was. wow. Okay, I am impressed. Uh, and basically, we are now doing a pantomime. Um, <laughs> okay, last one, and this this is the trickiest of the lot, but I reckon you can do it. Uh, on the first day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. A box, a box, a box, a box. Beautiful. Okay, let's let, let's do another one. Uh, on the second day of Christmas, my true love gave to me <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to do one more. Let's see how high you can go. On the third day of Christmas, my true love gave to me <laughs> Okay, right. Okay, you really do need a round of applause there. Three French hens. I was thinking it was three German chickens, but I just got that slightly wrong. Um, okay, I reckon we could go all the way up to 12 Lords of Leaping. Um, but I think, actually, already, I have proved to you that Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without poetry. Uh, you might say to me, though, those aren't poems, those are songs. And I might say to you, what's the difference? Songs are poems set to music. Hands up anyone who knows the carol in the bleak midwinter. Yeah? Okay. A few people. Great. Um, okay, so there it is. Um, it's uh, one of my favourite carols, uh, and it has a beautiful tune. Uh, so I'm just going to play you the first verse, uh, and you can, you can hear that tune. Here we go. Okay, lovely. Um, but here's the thing. In the Bleak Midwinter was originally written as a poem without music by a Victorian poet called Christina Rossetti. And it wasn't set to music. It wasn't given that tune until the 20th century by a composer called Gustav Holst in 1906. So as a poem, it is a piece of writing that already tried to make itself memorable without the music. And that, I think, is another good way to think about poetry. Poetry is writing that is patterned so that it contains its own music. Right, okay, what we're going to do now is take a look at this first verse of In the Bleak Midwinter just to work out some of the things that Christina Rossetti has done to her words to make them poetic, to give them that pattern uh, and to make us feel that bleak midwinter intensely as we read them. Uh, so you're going to know 
uh, the names of some of these things, some of these poetic techniques from your English lessons. So this is going to be uh, a quick fire round. Uh, let's take a look at that uh, second line there. Frosty wind made moan. Frosty wind made moan. So the weather is behaving like a human being, complaining about how cold it is, uh, or maybe, maybe it didn't get what it wanted for Christmas. Um, what would you call that? Okay, lots of hands going up. I'm just going to pick somebody at random over here. Yes, sir. Personification. There we are. Ten points. Okay. Um, great. Now, let's go on to the next couple of lines. Earth stood hard as iron, water like a stone. Okay, so this is basically a more interesting way of saying everything was frozen solid. What do we call that? Okay, I'm going to go for one over here. Uh, yes. It's a, it's a simile. Brilliant, yes. It's when a poet compares one thing to another thing. They love doing that, the poets. They absolutely love it. Simile, a kind of metaphor when you say one thing is like uh, another thing. Right, okay, let's keep going to the next lines. Snow had fallen. Snow on snow. Snow on snow. So here, Christina Rossetti is saying, I think, that it has snowed. <laughs> but she really wants you to understand that it snowed a lot. Um, there was lots of snow on snow, on snow, on snow. Um, <laughs> they had to make their own fun in Victorian times. Uh, so, poetically, um, if we're not going to call this filling up space, what would we call this technique? Uh, yes, I've, I can see someone in a very bright jumper here in front of me. Repetition. Repetition, exactly. This is repetition. Um, and because she's repeating the same words and the same sound, we could also call it uh, alliteration. Um, so that's one of those patterns that poets uh, love to put into their poems. Right, last example here. We have got, this isn't a line, these are the red words at the ends of the line. So moan and stone, snow and a go. So words that sound the same and give this poem that sense of pattern and structure and completeness. I'm going to go for somebody right at the back. Uh, yes, sir, in the grey jumper there. It is rhyme. Brilliant. Okay, well done. All right, another round of applause for you. <laughs> so, it is things like repetition, alliteration, rhyme, rhythm too, the way that each line uh, of this poem has a regular beat. In the bleak midwinter, frosty wind made moan. All these things are what I mean when I say that poetry is writing that contains its own music. But you might still say to me, people know in the bleak midwinter because it's a song, not because it's a poem. However, there is at least one Christmas poem which people know that hasn't been turned into a famous song. And I'm going to bet now that you will know it and you will remember its rhythm and its rhyme. So we're going to do it again. I'm going to give you the first line and you are going to give me the next one. Are you ready? Hey. Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house There you go, well done. Okay, um, now who knows uh, how it goes on? Anyone? Anyone memorize this poem? Okay, I'll tell you. Um, the stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. So this is, I'm pretty sure, the most famous Christmas poem of all. It's not a song, hasn't been set to music, but it has a good bouncy rhythm, and every line rhymes with the one next to it, so it's written in what we call rhyming couplets. And it's famous because it is so memorable, it's catchy, but it's also famous because it is the first poem, actually it seems to be the first piece of writing ever 
which describes what Father Christmas, or Santa Claus, does on Christmas Eve. So this poem, there is uh, more of it, uh, written out in the handwriting of the poet. Uh, It's called A Visit from St. Nicholas. So I'm sure you all know this, but St. Nicholas is Santa Claus's full name, if you say it fast. St. Nicholas, Santa Claus, that's how he got his name. And it was written almost 200 years ago in 1823. Would you like to hear the whole thing? Yeah, okay. All right, let us go to the Cave of Delights that is YouTube. Thank you, YouTube. See you soon. Right, so the poet uh, who wrote this poem uh, was the man uh, on the left there, uh, and he was called Professor Clement Clark Moore, uh, and he was a literature academic like me. He lived and worked 
in New York, in America, and he wrote this poem to entertain his children. I'm doing this lecture because my children dared me to. Thanks, kids. <laughs> so I feel as though Clement and I have quite a lot in common. The difference between us, though, is that his Christmas poem is super famous. You can get it on everything. It's been turned into a word search, Christmas cards, albums, books, obviously. Uh, and I particularly like uh, this T-shirt, which has uh, all those great reindeer names on it. Uh, Dasher and Dancer and Prancer and Vixen, Comet and Cupid and Donna and Blitzer. It's a little poem uh, in itself. So, hands up now, who agrees with me that Christmas wouldn't be Christmas without poetry? Okay, well, you see, I think my work here is done. We can all go for a break early. Um, but here uh, at the University of East Anglia, we don't just study literature. We don't just read literature. We're the school of literature, drama, and creative writing. So we teach people how to perform literature in drama uh, and how to write their own, how to write their own stories uh, and poems. Um, and that is what I want you uh, to help me do for the rest of this lecture, is to write a new Christmas poem. Do you think you can help me? Yeah? Okay, well, I, I'm, I'm going to give you some motivation here. Um, this is the bit where the chocolate coins come in, so pay attention. Right. One of my favorite books of Christmas poetry uh, is this one. It's called I Remember Christmas, and it's by an American poet uh, called Joe Brainard. Uh, and there he is uh, when he was a bit younger uh, than most of you. Um, and Joe Brainard wrote his Christmas poem using a brilliantly simple pattern. The only thing that he did, the only thing that he repeated in his poem was to start every new line with the words, I remember. And then he wrote down what came into his head about Christmas when he was a child. So, uh, he didn't write this when he was a child. Um, he wrote it when he was growing up, but he was remem remembering. So, uh, here are a few examples uh, of things that Joe Brainard remembered about Christmas. I remember Christmas tree lights reflected on the ceiling. So a lovely, cosy feeling of being inside and seeing those Christmas decorations uh, shining uh, in your living room. Um, here's another one. I remember not being able to fall asleep on Christmas Eve, so remembering how exciting it is uh, on the night before Christmas. Uh, okay, another one. I remember Christmas cards arriving from people my parents forgot to send Christmas cards to. Okay, yeah, there's some sort of chuckles of recognition going around the room here. Don't forget, last posting dates next week. Um, so this is a memory of something a bit awkward, but also for a child a bit funny. You know, seeing your parents feeling a bit caught out. Okay, uh, another one. I remember how sad and happy Christmas carols always made me feel all warm inside. So remembering sort of mixed feelings that you have. I mean, like in the bleak midwinter, it's a, it sounds like a really sad song. It has apparently really sad words, but it can also make you feel very happy. Uh, and last one, I remember after Christmas caroling, hot chocolate. So being outside in the cold, singing Christmas carols, and being rewarded with a lovely mug uh, of cocoa. Uh, so a happy memory. And as I say, this poem is, is very simple uh, in a way. It doesn't do anything poetically tricky like rhyme or personification or even simile. It just repeats this phrase, I remember. Uh, and this allows Joe Brainard to get straight to what is really perhaps the most important ingredient of all in a poem, feelings. All sorts of different Christmas feelings. So this is where your chocolate coins and your printed cards, your little UEA gift tags, are going to come in. Uh, and you should hopefully also uh, all uh, have a pen near you. Um, what I want everyone to do now, and I know, and I know I'm asking a lot, but uh, just go with this, okay? I would like you to eat your chocolate coins. <laughs> yeah? Do you think you can do that for me? Okay. And as you're eating your coins, if you can, close your eyes and say to yourself, I remember, and just see what Christmassy feeling pops into your head. And open your eyes and write it down on your gift tag. So this is uh, a real live moment of poetic inspiration. Write them down. I'll give you a minute. 
And then I'm going to come round uh, and I'm going to collect some of these Christmas memories. These are going to be the first ingredients in our Christmas poem. Right. How are you doing there? Right, how's everyone getting on? Have you managed to swallow those horrible ch chocolate coins? Yeah. You've got something in your head you can write down. Very serious faces here. You know, you're, I'm really impressed how seriously you're taking this. I hope these are not going to all be really sad memories of Christmas, though. Have you got one? Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty one. Can I have it? Can I put it in the pot? Can I put it in my Christmas pot. Okay. Yes, darling. Oh, okay. Where can I put it? Right, okay, shall I, um, I'm going to come round and take some of these Christmas memories off you because we're going to start putting ingredients into our magic Christmas poem pot. So I'm going to walk up and down and who's got one that they, they would like me to, if, if you hand these over by the way, you'll be able to, to collect them afterwards and take them home and hang them on your Christmas tree. Thank you, thank you. Oh, great. Okay, right. Wow, I'm getting absolutely covered in them here. Okay, right. I'm going to take one here, one here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I'm just going to randomly grab a few, going right up to the top. Thank you. Brilliant. There we are. Last one. One more. I think I have got enough already, but thank you. Hello. There we go. Oh, my word. Okay. Uh, I think... Thank you, thank you. Um, wow, okay, right. Is everyone good to stay here for another hour? <laughs> All right, I'm going to read some of these out. Oh, okay, we've got a brilliant one straight here. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks everybody. Um, yeah, if, if, if I've got yours here, um, we'll, we'll put it out of the back later so you can collect it, because as you can see, they make very attractive Christmas decorations. Um, so, uh, here's one. I remember snowballing my auntie. <laughs> I hope that was her reaction. Oh, this is a lovely one too. I remember the crackle of Christmas LP records. Ah, lovely old-fashioned nostalgic feeling. Um, I remember a uh, sweet calendar, creamy somethings. Creamy somethings, yeah, I love them. Um, I remember Christmas ornaments hung on the tree and waking up to a chocolatey calendar. Okay, yeah, yeah, the advent calendars. Right, okay, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna take a couple more here. Um, I remember going carol singing on frosty nights. Um, and I remember Christmas will always be full of joy and happiness. Okay, I'm gonna put that one in as the last one. And then a few more, there we are. Bit more there, and there we are. So we've got our Christmas feelings bubbling away in the pot. Um, but we do need a few more uh, special ingredients. Uh, and uh, at this point, I'm going to need, don't groan, I'm going to need some volunteers. I don't suppose anybody wants to come and unwrap some presents and wear a Santa hat, do they? No? Okay, all right. Uh, maybe, I don't know, could some of the people who are helping out do it? Um, okay, all right, there are quite a lot of hands I now see, so we're going to get three people to come down uh, and pop on these hats, and then we're going to open these presents which have been uh, there by the fire. Okay, um, so have we got someone to come out? Okay, yeah, someone, someone up here if you want to, do, do you want to, to bring somebody down up there? 
Okay. This, this is for children, by the way, growing up. Sorry, you, you, you'll have to. <laughs> okay, who's going to come down? Okay, well, someone has got their hand so high here, we are definitely going to have you. Okay, do you want to uh, choose your Santa hat? See which one fits. There's, there's quite a big one and there's quite a small one there. You're going to go for the medium size one. Yeah, okay, brilliant. All right, you stay there. Ah, okay, right. Take your, take your pick of Santa hat. I've got a feeling this is going to cover somebody's face. Another one here. Okay, is that, is that all right for you, your Santa hat? Okay, round of applause for our three Santa volunteers. You're there on the big screen, right, in front of the fire. Okay. Well, okay, I'm just going to wait for this. Uh, we are. Okay. Um, now, what we're going to do is one at a time, I'm going to ask you to open the, the stockings or the present sacks by the fire. And there's a present in there. And I'm going to ask you to take it, take out the box, pop it on the table. Oh, hello, we've got another one as well. Okay, do you want to come and help as well? That's all right. Yeah, here, come along. Uh, oh, and we've got a spare hat for you too. Here we are. Do you want to pop it on? Yeah, okay, excellent. Right, okay, um, so um, we are going to open these presents one at a time um, and we're going to find what's inside them uh, and I would like you to hold it up and show it to the audience. And at this point, I'm going to do something very important. I always do this in the lectures that I give at the university at this point. I put on uh, my, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to do it the other way around. I'm going to put on my, my red nose this is to show that it's the seri this is the serious bit now. Um, uh, and, and my reindeer antlers, yeah? And when you have opened the present and you've, you've held up what's inside it, I'm gonna play Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer on a kazoo. Okay, that, is, that, that has to happen. That always has to happen in all lectures in the university. Okay, so like <laughs> Yeah, okay. Um, so, <laughs> and then I want you to carefully put whatever's inside the present uh, into the pot. And I'm going to talk about a poem uh, which I've got, which tells us something about that present. Okay, so um, the first one is the one here. Uh, and would you two like to open up uh, what's inside here? Okay, so take it out. There you are. I'm going to lift up that box and go, go over there, pop it on the, on the table. Yeah. And open it up. I'm ready with my kazoo, and have a look inside. Can you see what it is? Okay, hold it up, okay. It is a big chocolate coin. So, why is there a big chocolate coin in this box? Well, when we serious doctors of literature uh, talk about poems, we often ask what a poem represents. The idea or the feeling that it symbolizes. Uh, something maybe that the poem isn't actually saying, but something that it can make us feel by telling us about this thing. So what does a big chocolate coin symbolise at Christmas? What does nice food symbolise at Christmas? Do you have any ideas here? Well, what would you think if you, if you read about a nice chocolate coin? How would you feel in a, in a poem? Happy. Happy. Yeah, very good. Yeah, you might feel frustrated because it's in a poem, like it's not a real chocolate coin. But yeah, you, you would get that feeling of happiness. Um, so I've got a, a poem here, which I'm going to show. Uh, so if we just go back to our slides for a minute. Da, da, da. Here we are. Um, which is about Christmas food uh, and feeling happy. Right, okay, so it is by this poet, uh, who's called Jean Binterbreeze, uh, and she is someone who lives uh, in England uh, and in Jamaica. And you can see her there. Uh, sitting on her veranda uh, in Jamaica with the sea uh, beyond. And this poem is about the difference between Christmas in these two places. Very nicely arranged there, everyone can see it, that's really nice. Um, so she's thinking about Christmas in England, when it's cold in December, and Jamaica, where it's warm. And because it's about being in Jamaica for Christmas, uh, she has written it so that it sounds like the way that she speaks in a Jamaican accent. So she, it, it's not called Christmas, it's called Christmas. Uh, and the poem tells us about a Christmas, which isn't the traditional cold English Christmas of wrapping up warm and eating turkey. It's this uh, Christmas in Jamaica, which for her involves plenty of sleeping uh, in the warm weather and then ending up on the beach eating roast fish, having a barbecue, having a feast on the beach. Has anyone, have, have you ever had uh, Christmas on the beach? 
No? Anyone, anyone spent Christmas on the beach? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, was it Holcomb? No. Okay. <laughs> Sheringham. Um, so, the feeling about Christmas in this poem, the feeling that our big chocolate coin symbolizes is happiness, contentment, feeling that we've got plenty of what we want. So, could we please pop our chocolate coin into our big Christmas poem pot? Thank you very much. Okay, right, now we're going to open the next present. So, if you would like to take that box out of there. There you go, it's quite big, it's a little bit heavy, that one. There we go. Uh, and pop it on the table, open it up. What is inside? Get my kazoo. It's a baby. Ah, ah, it's a baby. Well, babies are, of course, very important to lots of people at Christmas because a baby is the most important person in the Christmas story in the Bible. Baby Jesus, the Son of God. Um, so do you remember... Um, oh, sorry, I forgot about this. We were having a starfish on the beach to illustrate happiness. Um, do you remember this picture uh, of, uh, which was with uh, the In the Bleak Winter Carol. So this is uh, baby Jesus who was born in a stable because there was no room in the inn, and he's lying there in his manger in the hay with his mum and dad, Mary uh, and Joseph. Um, so this is a traditional nativity scene, and that's what uh, Christina Rossetti's Carol is about. And this is the story that my next poem is thinking about. Um, this poem is by an Australian poet called Francis Webb. Can you see him up there? Can you see him in the corner up there? Can, can any of you see what's on his shoulder? What's sitting on his shoulder? A bird. It's a bird, and it's a particular sort of bird. It's a parrot. Yeah, it's a parrot. So I assume this photo was taken when he was in Australia, and he had a parrot in his shoulder. Uh, he wasn't a pirate, by the way. He was a, he was a poet. Um, but Francis Webb didn't always live in Australia. For some of his life, he actually lived in Norwich. Uh, and when he was here, he wasn't very well. Uh, so he lived in a hospital that's out uh, in Helsden. Uh, and while he was there, he had a very nice doctor, uh, a, a real doctor, by the way, um, who encouraged him to write poems so that he would feel better. Um, and one day, the doctor's wife had a baby. And uh, a few days later, five days later, the doctor brought this baby, who was called Christopher John, into the hospital to show to all his patients. And Francis Webb held the baby, and he wrote this poem. He was inspired by holding this baby. Uh, he wrote this poem about how it reminded him of the Christmas story about the baby who was Jesus Christ, the Son of God, born in a stable. Uh, and this is the start of it. Christmas is in the air. You are given into my hands, out of quietest, loneliest lands. My trembling is all my prayer. Because when you're given a little baby to hold, you actually get quite nervous. Oh, I don't want to drop it. Um, to blown straw was given all the fullness of heaven. So he's thinking of that straw uh, uh, in the manger there. So what do we think that babies symbolize in Christmas poems? Well, in the Christmas story, uh, people come uh, to give the baby Jesus presents. There's the shepherds there with their crooks, and then in the stars you can see the wise men uh, who bring gifts, presents for him. And you might even notice how in this poem we get the word given twice, uh, and at the end it's rhymed with heaven. So being allowed to hold this baby for Francis Webb was like a gift. So what do you think that, that babies and, and Christmas presents might represent? What's the... Well, it's Jesus, yeah, but what do, what do you think having, being given a present means? Mm. Somebody gives you a present, what does that mean about how they feel? Do they hate you? They love you. They love you. Yeah, I think in Christmas poems, babies and the idea of presents, and there is a baby being given as a present, randomly, under a Christmas tree, um, it represents love. Uh, and you've held that baby, oh, what have we got here in the, in the box as well? Oh, I just found that. Oh, yeah, oh. I don't know how that got in there. Roy's Christmas gift guide. <laughs> Oh, okay, obviously the baby came from Roy's. Um, okay, you've, he you've held that baby very beautifully, very carefully, uh, and I think the baby might almost be asleep, so let's very quietly put the baby in the pot. It's okay, it's okay, we're not going to cook the baby. We're not going to cook the baby. <laughs> right, okay, are you, you're, you're, yeah, you're ready, aren't you? Okay, so let's have the final present. Uh, I'll help you open this sack here. There you go, get the box out. 
There you are. Pop it on the table and see what is inside. Okay, I'm ready with my kazoo. Okay, can I go yet? Are you ready? Come on. Oh, well, keep looking. Keep, keep, look. Just that? Just that, just the cotton wool. Okay, all right, actually, the cotton wool is the present. This is the thing in the box, because what does cotton wool look like? What does it look like? If you were a poet, what would you think cotton wool looked like? It looks like snow, doesn't it? Yeah, so this is the final ingredient in the Christmas poem. Um, it is snow, and that magical way that snow transforms the world. Yeah, that's right, get it all out. Okay, so I have got a, a poem about snow here, a Christmas poem, and it's also a little story. Um, it suddenly transforms the world of this poem, The Snow. Uh, it's by a poet called Charles Causley, and he lived in the countryside uh, near a moor, which is a place where you don't see many people, but you get plenty of cold weather. So, while you just sort that snow out there, I'm just going to read this little Christmas poem story. I'll actually tell you what, why don't you very carefully put it round the baby in the pot, because that will be lovely for the baby. The baby will have a lovely sleep. Okay, let's have this poem. At nine of the night... At nine of the night, I open my door that stands midway between moor and moor, and all around me, silver bright, I saw that the world had turned to white. So the world's been transformed, and he's found a metaphor to express this. Thick was the snow on field and hedge, and vanished was the river sedge, where winter skillfully had wound a shining scarf without a sound. So he's comparing the snow to a scarf that's wrapped up the world. And as I stood and gazed my fill, a stable boy came down the hill. With every step I saw him take, flew at his heel a puff of flake. His brow was whiter than the hoar, a beard of freshest snow he wore, and round about him snowflakes starred, a red horse blanket from the yard. In a red cloak I saw him go, his back was bent, his step was slow, and as he laboured through the cold, he seemed a hundred winters old. I stood and watch the snowy head, the whiskers white, the cloak of red. A Merry Christmas, I heard him cry. The same to you, old friend, said I. So what's happened in this little story? The poet stepped outside into the snow and he's seen a young man uh, who works looking after horses, a stable boy walking towards him. But as he becomes closer, this young man seems to be transformed by the snow, but see, he has a beard of snow and a red blanket for keeping horses warm has become a red cloak. And he also seems to get older with every step he takes, so that he doesn't seem young, but ancient, a hundred winters old. He has, in other words, been magically changed by the snow into, who do we think it is? It's Father Christmas, Santa Claus, isn't it? He doesn't say that in the poem, but that's what's happened. This magical snowy landscape has turned this stable boy into Santa Claus. And that is what I think snow often brings into Christmas poems, a sense of magic, a world where things can be suddenly changed. Okay, so let's put all that snow carefully, carefully around the baby, don't wait the baby. Okay, into the pot. It's not real. It's not real, oh, okay. Okay, that is a weight off my mind. Right. Okay, let's have a big round of applause for our Father Christmas volunteers. You come, come round this way, and I'm going to pluck those hats off your heads as you go. Bum, 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 bum. Down you go, back to your seats. Can you go back? Up that way. And as you go, I'm going to do one last. Right. We have now got all our ingredients for the Christmas poem. We've got some food for happiness. We've got a baby for love. We've got some snow for magic. And most importantly, we've got everyone's Christmas memories. We need to give it a mix. I don't suppose anyone has brought a large wooden spoon today, have they? Anyone? Oh, yes, you there in the front, the mouse. Would you like to come down with your wooden spoon? Round of applause for this very... Uh, uh, Thoughtful mouse. Right, mouse. Um, c 
could you please give all of our Christmas poem ingredients a good mix? Now, be careful. Don't wait. Oh, it's not real, is it, that baby? But still, be careful with the baby. Okay, so just give it a good stir. Okay. <laughs> How's it going? How, how, is the baby all right? Yeah? Okay. Um, do you think it's all mixed together? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. It smells really Christmassy. You can't, probably can't smell it over there. Um, okay, let us see what Christmas poem we've made. Are you ready? Let's have a countdown. Three, two, one. Ta-da! I remember Christmas. Here is our Christmas poem. Okay, let's read it out. Do you read it with me? I remember chocolate money in a bag as gold as honey. I remember brand new toys. Grandma always went to Roy's. Lots of grandmas do. I remember fallen snow rainbowed by the big tree's glow. I remember Christmas time making up this Christmas rhyme. Wow, I think you need to give yourselves a round of applause for writing this poem. <laughs> so we've got food, we've got happiness, we've got presents, we've got love, we've got snow, we've got magic, we've got memories, we've got a poetic pattern, we've got rhyme, which is a very good way for remembering things. But there is just one problem with what we've just done. And actually, it's pretty bad. We have done something that you really shouldn't do. Do you know what it is, Mouse? Yeah, we have opened our Christmas presents early. Okay, um, I think we're gonna have to fix this before we finish. How can we get some new presents to hang uh, by the fire? Mm. Okay, I've got an idea. Um, you remember how I was saying that magic is an important ingredient of poems. And some people think that the oldest poems, some of the first poems, were actually magic spells. And you can see why people might think that, because poems are a kind of magic. They make you see things and imagine things that aren't really there. So maybe we can use some poetry magic to get some new presents. Will you help me one last time here? Yeah? Okay. Um, Mouse, um, can you please start mixing our poem pot again? And will everyone please help me read out the most magical poem of all? Give it, give it a good mix. We're really going to need to go for this. Okay, so can you read this with me? <laughs> Twas the night before Christmas when all through the house not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Ah, okay. Um, mouse... I'm not sure this is going to work. I think we're going to have to ask you to go and sit back down with your wooden spoon. But thank you very much for your help. Mwah. OK, let's see if we really can magic up someone to bring us some more presents. So let's read a bit more of that poem. You, we'll all do it together. He was dressed all in fur from his head to his foot and his clothes were all tarnished with ashes and soot. A bundle of toys he had flung on his back, and he looked like a peddler just opening his pack. His eyes, how they twinkled, his dimples, how merry. His cheeks were like roses, his nose like a cherry. His droll little mouth was drawn up like a bow, and the beard on his chin was as white as the snow. He had a broad face and a little round belly, which shook when he laughed like a bowl full of jelly. He was chubby and plump, a right jolly old elf. And I laughed when I saw him in spite of myself. A wink of his eye and a twist of his head soon gave me to know I had nothing to dread. He spoke not a word, but went straight to his work and filled all the stockings.
then turned with a jerk. <laughs> and laying a finger aside of his nose and giving a nod, up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his sleigh, to his team gave a whistle. <whistles> and away they all flew like the down of a thistle. But I heard him exclaim, ere he drove out of sight, Happy Christmas to all, and to all a good night. <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this Christmas lecture. Uh, and all I want to do is to wish you a very happy Christmas. Thank you.